Good morning. Hello. Hi, sir. Good, Good morning. morning. Thank you. Thank you so morning, much sir. for your time. I'll take a minute to introduce you, though you don't need much of an introduction. But at the same time, it gives me very proud feeling that India's economic advisor comes with a lot of global experience and hands-on experience. And uh, in the next 45 minutes, we will, of course, listen to uh, how you see situations panning out. So here I go. Mr. V. A. Nageshwaran is an Indian economist with the 18th Chief Economic Advisor to Government of India. To his credit, he served as the Global Chief Investment Officer at Bank Julius Baer in Switzerland and after serving as its Head of Research for Asia. Prior to this, he worked for CSFB Switzerland and in Singapore and for the Union Bank of Switzerland, now UBS. So he has worked with some of the best and largest global wealth houses. He has served as the Dean of IFMR Graduate School of Business, as a pro professor for graduate students at Singapore Management University, and also at the in Indian Institute of Management, Bangalore. To his credit, he has lots of books also, The Rise of Finance, The Economics of Derivatives, and he was a weekly columnist for Mint also for almost 15 years. So with his background of global economics, specialization in derivative and currencies, I think we are, as a country, with a very strong advisor. So Mr. Nageshwaran, the first question we would like to know is with a huge success that Indian media has projected, global media has projected for G20. What do you think are the ramifications for India as a country and India Inc. also? Thank you very much uh, for this opportunity to interact with your clients. And uh, uh, the G20 presidency is coming to an end in November and we had the leader summit last week. Uh, for India, the direct relevance uh, comes in the ability to be able to raise international multilateral financing for our infrastructure projects, including energy transition. So to that extent, the MDB reform agenda of the G20, which India has uh, very strongly pushed ahead with the constitution of the independent expert group under the convenership of uh, Mr. N.K. Singh and uh, Professor Larry Summers uh, has already submitted its uh, first report. Second report is due in October at the fourth finance minister central bank governors meeting in Marrakesh. So I think the most direct relevance to India is the not only for India, but for global south is the ability to mobilize international, especially public sector financing for development needs and for meeting challenges such as pandemic and uh, and energy transition. There are other areas like regulation of cryptos where I think developing countries are seeing capital outflows and therefore to have a common minimum standard of regulation and uh, making the developed country regulators aware of the macro consequences of this for developing countries is also an important milestone uh, of the Indian G20 presidency. I'm speaking mainly from the finance track perspective. Uh, and then, of course, uh, both finance track and Sherpa track and the G20 have taken a lot of efforts and made impressive strides in, uh, uh, in sensitizing and impressing upon the rest of the world the progress that India has made in using, in creating the digital public infrastructure and using mm. it to serve the common good and the public. At the same time, India also has not failed to acknowledge what other countries have done uh, in this area. And therefore, India served as a good uh, forum. The Indian G20 presidency served as a good forum for showcasing not just India's achievements, but also other developing country achievements, such as, uh, you know, Kenya or Brazil, Indonesia, etc., and brought them to the attention of the entire G20 community. So I'll stop here. These are the three key uh, uh, contributions that India's uh, G20 presidency has made. 
But you don't see any medium term ramification on India Inc. in terms of uh, what? Indirect. I'm sure it is not direct, direct, but yeah. indirect. Well, I think for uh, India Inc., particularly the OECD uh, uh, negotiated agreement on taxation, uh, Pillar 1, Pillar 2 will have implications for uh, India Inc. And certainly the, uh, the issue of uh, sustainability and climate related disclosures, which uh, SEBI is also uh, mandating under its business sustainability reporting, BRSR reporting, uh, will be uh, relevant for businesses. And at the same time, for uh, uh, private sector to be able to bring in its own capital, uh, the emphasis that G20 placed on the multilateral institutions de-risking private capital, whether it is domestic or international, on for, for climate-related investments will be of direct relevance to the corporate sector. So coming back to little macro globally, yeah. uh, and then once again, its impact on India. How do you all see that despite the sharpest and largest rise in interest rates in US, the economy continues to show a lot of resilience? What is it that is driving this resilience? And how do you think things can pan out? And in that reference then, how is India placed? Look, I mean, that's a good question. Honestly, uh, even the Federal Reserve is surprised presently, I hope, by the resilience of the U.S. economy in terms of employment generation, uh, in terms of retail sales growth, etc. So I think um, the, and even in the <coughs> calendar uh, third quarter of the United States, uh, the growth rate is going to be uh, quite good. That's what we understand from the now casting estimates, etc. So what has... Uh, uh, made the U.S. economy so resilient in this cycle, despite uh, interest rates going up by 500 basis points already, and they are going to announce their uh, interest rate decision today, tonight, later in Indian time. But it is it will be presumptuous on my part to try and guess the 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 the, the, the causes behind this resilience when even the Federal Reserve is surprised by the resilience. Uh, and therefore, it is quite possible that at some point, maybe we are all underestimating the lagged effect of the massive stimulus that was given in 2020 and continued until 2021 as well. Maybe that's the reason. So we can only guess. Oh, obviously, as far as India is concerned, it is very clear that compared to the previous cycles, the impact of uh, the US tightening cycle in India has been relatively muted. The rupee has been stable. In fact, uh, Mr. Sajid Chinaya of JP Morgan wrote a very good article last week about the 10 years of uh, taper tantrum and how macroeconomic stability has helped India to negotiate the US tightening cycle much more smoothly this time than in the past. So I think India right now is not concerned by the impact of any further tightening or any further decision by the United States to keep the interest rates at high levels. I don't think it will have major ramifications for India. We need to, uh, therefore, we are having degrees of freedom to be able to make our monetary policy decisions based on our uh, situations and our context and our needs. So do we think that the kind of <clears throat> decoupling is ensuing because we managed our finances uh, in our own independent way and didn't give in so much to the uh, pandemic. Uh, yeah, I think it's a good point. Not, it's not just finances. Yes, you are right. India's uh, pandemic-related spending was uh, and, and support to the vulnerable sections was targeted. And India didn't splurge too much on fiscal policy or monetary policy stimulus. And also India did a very good job of vaccination. And I think uh, we probably do not fully comprehend when we cannot. I'm not saying it's a mistake. We cannot comprehend the counterfactual, what might have been India's current state had fiscal and monetary policy been too loose in those years. And if the vaccination drive was not successful or if it was tardy, uh, the economy would be in a far, far worse shape. And I think uh, not enough credit is being given to the government for managing these three years, especially considering what is going on elsewhere in the world. That is one part. The second part is not just finances, even the central bank was quite uh, relatively nimble 
in raising interest rates and mm. also taking liquidity measures, etc. So the macroeconomic stability, which includes both fiscal and monetary and financial stability, were not sacrificed in India. They actually stood out as strengths. So the impact of the global monetary tightening cycle, therefore, was less on India precisely because the stability parameters were maintained. So going forward as well, the impact of the United States keeping its interest rates high or even tightening further, et cetera, will be not so strong in India provided there is a proviso here, provided we still maintain the macroeconomic stability. That's the precondition. Certainly. So you have been a currency expert all throughout. So you understand the dynamics of currency much better than most of us. And now at the helm of the affairs, uh, what do you think the way the world projects, and of course we also project ourselves to be the, and it's a fact that we are the fastest growing economy and the youngest economy. So the time horizon for which we can continue to grow is very, very long, which in turn means that this is the perfect location for long only money to reside and ride through this demographic cycle. So also our policy framework is now so tuned to be whatever we call it, China plus one or Europe plus one, uh, but to some way start suiting the manufacturing as the option. So FDI flows can also be good. Uh, so how do you see our currency panning out both vis-a-vis -a, a, of course, inflation, but B, most important, the FDI, FII flows vis-a-vis uh, -vis our uh, trade deficit. What is the broader view that government and in you particular have taken? My goodness, this <laughs> is yeah, such a multi-layered question. And I think I it would probably take uh, two hours to answer all of this. I'll be happy. <laughs> uh, ultimately, currency, in fact, uh, does get impacted by a lot of developments that you mentioned. Talked about the fastest growing economy, the attention given to manufacturing, and then you spoke about FDI and FII flows. I mean, there were so many uh, layers and assumptions here that we need to keep in mind. Yes, we are growing well, and I think um, we are expected to grow well in the next financial year as well, not just in FI24. And in general, if you look at it, the fact that we paid our uh, due share of uh, cost in terms of growth last decade because of balance sheet problems in Correct. the banking, non-banking and corporate sectors. And we are now put them behind us. That is what is giving us a great platform to build on that and uh, anticipate Precisely. steady growth of around six and a half percent in real terms every year and about 11 percent or so in nominal okay. terms, uh, in, in, in local currency terms uh, for the rest of the decade. And that should take us to what I call seven by seven in seven uh, US dollar, seven trillion in seven years by 2030. Because at the end of March 23, we were at 3.4 trillion plus. Correct. So now the manufacturing um, is obviously a low share of GDP compared to what we would like it to be. And there is still scope for uh, improving this. And the government has uh, done two or three things to make it happen. Ultimately, the proof of the pudding will be in the eating and that will come not only from government's efforts, but also from the private sector. Now, what are the two or three things that the government has done? One is, of course, manufacturing was hampered by absence of good physical infrastructure, hmm. both the uh, digital and physical connectivity. These have been attended to. The road network, the air network, the railway network and the augmentation of capacity in Indian ports and logistics improvements such as fast tag, et cetera, all these things are basically reducing last mile cost, the connectivity cost, et cetera, for our manufacturing and for our exporters, whether it is whether they're serving domestic market or foreign markets, these logistics costs have to come down and the creation of physical infrastructure is contributing to that. The second thing, of course, what the government has done is of course, um, ease of doing business. 
uh, many compliances, formalities, and repealing of uh, outdated laws, etc. That's an ongoing exercise, by the way. There is much to be done, but much has been done as well. That is also helping businesses concentrate their critical management bandwidth on running the business rather than concentrating on compliance. The third thing that the government has done is, of course, to uh, announce the production linked incentive schemes, which is to clearly signal that the government is placing a high degree of premium on, on increasing the manufacturing share of the GDP. And the digital connectivity definitely is also bringing down communication costs and efficiencies uh, and, and creating, contributing along with the GST, creating a pan-India market. And there, I think the goods and services tax and the insolvency and bankruptcy code are helping create scale in India. Manufacturing needs scale and we need a large market. So, so these are all the multi-pronged efforts of the government. Physical, digital infrastructure, ease of doing business, uh, announcement of the PLI schemes and Gati Shakti, which is also about project implementation and also uh, legislative reforms like goods and services tax and, and insolvency and bankruptcy code are all contributing to creating scale. And manufacturing can succeed only when we have efficiencies and economies of scale. So this is government's contribution to that. And that will keep growth in good stead, hopefully in the coming years, because last two years have been pandemic impacted. So once the pandemic effects go out of the data, then we will see the manufacturing impact coming through. You spoke about FDI and China plus one. By the way, China plus one, I mean, I would recommend to you as well as to the rest of the people listening into this uh, conversation. Uh, there is a group called the Rhodium Group, R-H-O-D-I-U-M, Rhodium Group. And I think you can look it up on the internet and um, a couple of excellent pieces of research. I mean, honestly, I haven't yeah. read uh, across different topics. Uh, in general, if you want to assess the quality of research, the one that they put out just about a week ago or uh, September 13th on how will the China plus one play out globally is an excellent piece of research. And it luckily, it's publicly available. We will definitely read I think uh, so. It is not going to happen overnight. Yeah, and China has embedded itself in global value chains at, at all levels. And it's not easy for companies to extricate themselves. And even if they extricate a portion of it and put and, 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 and create capacity elsewhere in the world, for certain other things, they may continue to depend on China. So this thing is not, I mean, as I always tell people, these things don't happen at the speed with which you can write out a tweet. People think, oh, China plus one. Uh, why is China plus one? Why is India benefiting? Why is the proof? It doesn't happen that quickly. So that's something we need to be aware of. And then on the FDI, uh, recently there was an article in Bloomberg, very good article about how political, geopolitical pol pol polarization is also impacting where FDI flows and why. So <clears throat> my sense is that the Indian rupee, by and large, and I think, you know, it is, uh, as I always tell my students when I used to teach, uh, if you want to know an exchange rate forecast, just uh, take out a coin from your wallet and just toss and decide head or tail. I mean, that will be as good as any other forecast, uh, up to three years at least. Beyond three years, you might say fundamentals will dominate. And that is empirical history. So I, I, I don't venture out to make an Indian rupee forecast, uh, and it is not a government's view. But I think, by and large, I do expect uh, from uh, in the rest of the decade, Similar to how the Indian rupee performed between 2003 and 2008. Uh, in, in that period, Indian rupee actually appreciated against the US dollar. Exactly. If, I, if I'm not mistaken, it was as, it was started at, at a low of 48 and the highest value was 39 against the dollar and before it again depreciated and so on. But, I, but this time, I think it could, it could happen because at some point, the dollar strength will give uh, if not now, if not maybe in 24 or whatever. And I think if India manages to maintain macroeconomic stability and steady growth with, uh, with lower inflation compared to historical averages, then the returns available from the Indian market, whether it is fixed income or equity or direct investments will be better. And that will support the Indian rupee. So I do have a, a, a slightly optimistic view on the Indian rupee for the rest of the decade. But it's a personal view. And we all know that exchange rate forecasts are 
very dicey. But I'm so, happy to hear that. So because I'm your happy question to hear was that. Uh, because your question was multi-layered, my answer was a bit long. I'm sorry about that. Not at all. So two legs to this question, I will just uh, come up with. One is, of course, we are, there is a talk for a while, and now it is resurfaced about the inclusion of India into the uh, bond index, and thereby in turn increasing the availability of capital at 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 uh, the same time the cost of capital. What have you to say on that? Is there certain formalities as a country that we need to do, which is on the way? What is really the status of that? You mean on the bond index inclusion? Yeah. I think that's a question best posed to RBI because these uh, bond index providers uh, do talk to RBI regularly. And uh, so we are also consuming the same news that you are consuming. And uh, yes, there are some stories about uh, Sumoto inclusion of India uh, by because this is the month when they do this uh, index rejigging. All I would say is... Um, we should be not we should be careful in making sure that the potential for some inflows has to be balanced against macro stability because countries mm -hmm. which were considered middle income countries in our neighborhood because of high levels of external debt uh, ended up with the crisis as we saw in sri lanka in the last 2 years or so so we need to have a longer term perspective. It is not about attract. It is not about. It's not a prestige issue to get a membership into a club. Okay, uh, I mean it's not a, a feather on our cap to say we are part of J.P. Morgan Bond Index or Bloomberg uh, Barclays Index or whatever. That's not the point. I think, and at the moment, India isn't having any difficulty financing the current account uh, external balances. And in, in, actually, right now, investors are indeed looking for alternatives, given what is happening with uh, Russia and other emerging markets where they don't have alternatives. So when, support, uh, when, when times are good is the time when you have to build your roof, as they say, when the sun is shining. So now, because there is so much of interest in India, we do some of these things and then we collect lots of money and they come in because, you know, markets and investors in general can be subject to herd mentality for a long period before they wake up to the fundamentals. And then by the time um, they wake up, they themselves might have contributed to fundamentals going out of alignment. And that is what we faced between 2003 and 8, even though at the time we were not part of any bond index, but the equity flows and capital flows were way too high for an Indian economy to digest at that time. Digest. So I think we should be, and this is not a, this is not some sort of a, a prestige or a badge of honor. We it's an economic decision, and we need to be mindful of the opportunities in the near term to get attract some investments. But after all, it is their own interest. Indian equity markets have delivered in the last thirty years risk adjusted return in dollar terms much better than the all country world index of Morgan Stanley or the emerging True. market index. So investors are looking for opportunities. It is not that India is looking for such portfolio flows at this point. Uh, and 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 with the fully accessible route, the market is in any way open to foreigners at this point. So index inclusion is not something that is the be all or end all of India's external balances management. Got it. Sure. So coming back, one question on this FDI and the kind of uh, capital investments growth that we are seeing. Uh, from government on infrastructure and private sector also warming up. How is the electricity situation in India currently? And are we going to see some roadblocks as the peak season comes? And how are we going to navigate it in the short term as well as medium term? I'm not very sure about the numbers that I have on electricity generation at all. So I don't know if I can't address this question because this is not something that I'm tracking on a regular basis. It comes to our notice only if some things go wrong. And the fact that it hasn't come to our notice, I probably take it that things are in, uh, things are okay. But your question is relevant from a medium term perspective because uh, we do have to cater to the demands of energy transition, which our own net zero targets of 2070 um, and we have committed to uh, uh, increase non-fossil fuel capacity creation of at least 50%. We are well on track to, uh, to achieve that by 2030. And uh, 
So I think the in, the challenge in switching to renewable energy or increasing its share in the overall install capacity and generation is to ensure, is to make sure that we do have the availability of critical minerals and rare earths required. Nuclear energy has to be part of the equation and ultimately affordable and reliable power supply will also depend on being able to charge, uh, being able to recover cost. And bulk of the action, therefore, has to still lie with the state. Some of them have been taking action in the last two, three years on raising tariffs, etc. But we still have to, but there are still uh, distribution losses which need to be accounted for in state budgets, etc. So I think there is still a lot of work to be done in getting our energy sector onto an economically viable path as well as from an availability and affordability point of view as well, we will be facing challenges in managing the energy transition and making sure we do have the ingredients required rather than critical minerals. So it is from that perspective, I agree on the importance of power generation and distribution as an area of attention for policymakers. But in the near term, in the next six months or so, I'm not seeing specific issues arising as far as I know. Yeah. So while we... Uh, understand from this broader discussion that the medium term for India looks very well set, looking at, as what we say, the twin balance sheets being in a good space, that is the government revenues on one hand, the bank's balance sheet and the corporate balance sheet, all are in reasonably very good shape. Uh, so looks like we will uh, continue to see the path of growth that we have charted. Uh, but a couple of questions here. In short term, do you think that the rising oil prices or the disturbed monsoon and the crop because of that can play havoc in our this year's either growth or uh, inflation and resultant corporate outlook? Uh, these are good questions. And I think RBI just came out with its uh, monthly state of the economy uh, report. And the uh, Department of Economic Affairs will also be coming out with its own uh, uh, monthly economic review in the next few days. And the monsoon deficit of August, if anything, has slightly come down by three percentage points. And uh, it's about 8% on an all India basis. Uh, so therefore, this is a manageable situation. And oil prices up to $100 RBI at the beginning of the year assumed the number of... Uh, uh, $100 uh, in its forecast of 6.5%, although the government of India doesn't make any oil price forecast. So, so far it is still okay. I agree that it is, a, it is a situation that needs to be watched and oil prices are becoming a topic of discussion even uh, in advanced country uh, policy settings now. G given that it has gone up, Brent crude prices have gone up from low 70s to 95 now and that's a big, big almost 40% exactly. in, a, in a space of three months. It will definitely impact. But quantitatively, how much will they impact the growth depends on whether they are being passed on or not. Because if they are not passed on, obviously the implications will be on the FISC or uh, below the line liabilities. We don't know about it. So at this point, I don't see uh, both of them as uh, immediately... Uh, contributing to any downgrade of our growth expectations of around six and a half percent in real terms for the current financial year. And still, the expectation is that given um, the possibility of growth decelerating in the developed world at some point, I think demand conditions will probably dominate supply restraint being imposed by oil producers and the prices should, I mean, if I were to put on my hat, of uh, investment uh, investment uh, or, or capital market participant, which I used to wear uh, some time ago, I would be more inclined to bet on oil prices becoming lower in three to six months time rather than becoming further higher from this point onwards. That is the view I would take. But um, so- uh, Because so, the core so, fundamentals do not support, uh, support a this, but Some of it is algorithm driven uh, as has always been the case. I mean, for example, in the last leg of 2007 to 2008, oil prices doubled from 70 to 140 yeah, in about six to eight months. It was completely unsustainable. And right. given the current context, this 40% increase, roughly 40% increase in Brent crude prices also, in my opinion, unsustainable. 
If anything, uh, it probably is going to make the global economy slow down even bigger risk than what it was three months ago, given the price has gone up this much. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I, I I don't see them and we are comfortable at this moment keeping our six and a half percent real GDP forecast for, 20, for FY24. So one area which somehow uh, I think we have not delivered despite being now two terms is divestment. Divestment was a topic before uh, this government came. I think it made genuine efforts, but market initially believed that this is the government which will really deliver. This was their intent that they want to do governance, but not management. But somehow we have not progressed on divestment. What do you think? Why so? Uh you know, divestment process is always uh, the political economy has to be considered. And uh, yes, the public sector at the same time, the government has also been trying to improve their management and they have been declaring good dividends and profitability has improved. So ultimately, divestment cannot be taken as sort of an obsession or a mantra. It is important because the government can definitely play its part in development expenditure using those resources and where the private sector can run these uh, enterprises more successfully, it should be with the private sector. And the prime minister has very clearly said that the government has no business to be in business and that is how the Air India privatization happened, etc. But I think the political and, and state governments themselves raise many objections, etc. Sometimes even when the central government has been keen to divest some of these enterprises. It is a work in progress. Sometimes once you sort of cross some inflection point or get over a hump, then it, it will open the floodgates. So I think uh, in the... Uh, I am still hopeful that the divestment uh, 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 agenda will pick up momentum uh, probably from 2024 onwards. Yeah. One more thing going up to election this year uh, and seeing what happened in last couple of quarters, yeah. that all the states who are going into elections are uh, using very populist measures once again as their key uh motivation for coming to power or that is what people should expect from them and that of course ultimately cost states exchequer and the whole drive to spend our hardened money on infrastructure sometimes get diluted by these populist schemes how do you see this playing out uh, and putting a pressure on our combined resource availability or deficit, so to say? I think uh, that is not only one, that's not the only story, that's, all, that's part of the story. I mean, uh, data, again, RBI's uh, State of the Economy uh, chapter or article in the monthly September bulletin also points out, and we have also been saying that, that state governments have indeed ramped up capital expenditure as well. The union government has also created a lot of infrastructure and put emphasis on capital expenditure in the last six years. It is, you know, it's, it's visibly evident as well. And states have also done, um, uh, you know, tariff revisions on transportation, uh, on, on electricity, and some of the states have re-indexed their property sector values. So they do all these things as well. And yes, I think there are there is populist spending as well, and it is not just true of India. It is true of many democracies, and in fact, the United States and many other countries, for example, kept up their COVID stimulus well beyond uh, the peak of COVID, etc. So I think mm -hmm. uh, this is something that uh, the discourse has to keep emphasizing, and I think uh, fiscal policy frameworks would help. And RBA also has come out with a very good article in the monthly bulletin on the uh, unsustainability or economic non-viability of reverting to the old pension scheme, etc. So it is a work in progress, and it has to be, the discourse has to be kept up. And the pressure and the union government has also been uh, putting a lot of emphasis on expenditure management, including information systems improvements and cash flow management, and also tying some of the aid, additional borrowing capacity to states, 
uh, contingent on certain reforms in the power sector, etc. So it is a mixed bag. It is not just only the populist uh, promises that we need to focus on. And uh, the proof of the pudding also is in the fact that the state governments are uh, running the fiscal deficits at the moment below the 3% threshold, not even going to 3%, let alone drawing upon the additional 0.5% leeway given to them, etc. So I think it is something that uh, is happening and we definitely have to keep up the discourse, but uh, we need to be aware of and acknowledge all the good things that are happening as well on the fiscal front. Yeah. I will allow uh, audience to also ask questions and Ram to lead it. Ram is my colleague. Ram, over to you. Hi, hi, Chatta. So we have some questions in the chat box. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm one seeing the them myself. I mean, I see one on the yeah. PLI. Uh, yeah. I think the earlier, rest of the earlier questions we have. Great answer, sir. I mean, I mean, for example, impact of India, Middle East, Europe corridor. I mean, frankly, just been announced. It's very difficult to see. I mean, these things will definitely have an impact. There's no question about that. But to be able to give a intelligent answer to that question at this point, we don't have information to give an answer to that question. The impact of India, Middle East, Europe corridor, and uh, the PLI implementation. Uh, where is the friction? I mean, it is. It is. Uh, it is. It is a scheme which provides incentives if you meet employment and production targets. So if you don't meet them, you don't get the incentive. And uh, the schemes were announced in 2020, March, November, and then something even in 2022 as well. The drones were added, etc. And 22, 23, 21, 22, and 22, 23 were considered incubation years where companies have to make their applications, investment proposals approved and et cetera. So it is as per the DPIIT, it is making progress. Uh, the, uh, the investment flows are happening, employment generation is happening. And uh, I think, uh, as I said, in the case of the China plus one example, I think uh, in this world of uh, uh, relatively compressed attention spans, I think we are also probably little too impatient to look for results. The indication on the direct taxes. Direct also. taxes, I'm coming to that. Yeah. I mean, direct taxes, again, after the second quarter advanced tax data was released, I don't think this question is still relevant. Yeah. Uh, uh, personal taxes were doing quite well in any case and corporate tax also. Maybe companies were initially conservative about the profitability estimates or they could have been uh, actually calculating that instead of paying advanced tax, I would rather divert the money for capital formation, investment expenditure. But the second quarter data, which we got earlier this week, last yesterday, or day before, confirms that advanced tax collections have indeed risen. And corporate profitability is doing well. So if anything, the initially slow growth of advanced tax payments is probably going to be made up in the subsequent quarters. Sir, I would request you to look at the Q&A window of the question, uh, for questions. Do you have an access? Yeah, there are different I do, I questions. Do. So, I, I mean, there are both in the chat window as well, there are in the Q&A window as well. We have to exhaust, we can exhaust one of them or both of them at some point. Uh, I'll first exhaust the webinar chat window, then I'll go on to the Q&A window. And then there is a U.S. drawing oil from its reserves, higher level sustaining. We answered this question on the oil price already. Uh, again, we answered the question on the Indian manufacturing uh, sector quite in detail. So I think uh, most of these questions on the yes, sir, uh, any, on and, then the, and then the rating upgrade and bond inclusion probability. I think this is the topic that has been beaten to death. Uh, the credit rating upgrade happens when they decide. I mean, we do have uh, we have presented our we do interact with them regularly uh, on India's growth potential performance and how we have never defaulted and our uh, fiscal payments and interest payments are actually kind of transfers because it is mostly held within the country in Indian rupee terms, etc. But they do point out that interest payments as a percentage of tax revenue is the highest in India uh, in, among G20, for example. So it is, um, so we need to just keep plugging away. 
Frankly, if you look at the U.S. 10-year Treasury yield uh, that has gone up in the last one plus year and the spread to the Indian 10-year Treasury has only compressed. It has not widened out. So, and if we are able to do go from triple B minus to triple B plus, yes, we will see another 50 to 80 basis points of interest rate compression on the 10 year, for example. And we are getting there. And I think uh, post 2024, there'll be probably greater momentum on this uh, improving the underlying FISC uh, in terms of interest payments, reducing the debt uh, ratios such that the interest payments can come down. That is where I think uh, an earlier question on disinvestment and uh, asset monetization and privatization will come in handy to use these asset receipts to pay down liabilities as well. Okay, now we move on to question. Uh, I'm sorry, future major structural economic reforms. I don't have an answer to that question at this point. We know the areas that need to be attended to. Uh, some of these came up in the course of the conversation. What more could be done to raise the share of manufacturing? I think we have discussed it already. Uh, extensive monsoon flood. I think the last two questions are relevant, sir, uh, the only rest of answer. Yeah. Why is there a continuous gap between GOIs? I don't think so. If anything, the gap has been narrowed. In fact, even S&P recently upgraded its forecast for FY24 to 6.6%. World Bank and ADB's forecasts are, uh, are in very much in line with the forecast of RBI and our own estimate from the Ministry of Finance. Uh, quality of economic data, yes, it, there is, it is good and there is room for improvement. Both answers are possible. And yes, the base years have to be revised. The baskets have to be updated. Whether it is wholesale price index, we have to move towards the producer price index. We have to update some of the surveys, which could not be done during the COVID years. Census has to happen. So all these things, we are the policymakers are aware and work is ongoing. Okay. I think maybe we have sorry, also, answered all the questions. Uh, probably reached the forty-five minute mark, and I think I have I have addressed all the questions that were posed. Yeah. Thank you so much for your very frank uh, and straightforward uh, discussion with us. But being at the helm of a, a global investment bank or a wealth management outfit, what would you? In your past avatar, would I advise which are the economies where people should focus in terms of their investment portfolio? And uh, where do you think that, India that focuses? That is a question that I would not answer given the hat okay. that I'm wearing right now. Okay, no problem, sir. Thank I you. thought I just from the perspective of India, uh, I wanted to know. But so still, we have discussed I... already for 45 minutes about how well. Yes, we did. Yes, we did. And, yes. Uh, uh, how India is doing well. It's a good story. And we see in the data and uh, how investors are very buoyant about India. I think uh, it is kind of self-evident. Sure. Thank you so much for your time. You're welcome. Thank it you, sir. It was absolutely a pleasure. Thank you. Thanks, sir.